So burns are a form of trauma. So we always, in trauma, have to think about our primary survey, A, B, C, D. Airway with C-spine control, breathing with ventilation, circulation with hemorrhage control, disability for neurological function and status. Now, people that are subject to burns have often been in a, an environment where things are burning, fairly obviously. This is especially true with car fires and house fires. And these patients can come in and they really stink of the fire. You can really smell it. So first of all, we need to think about airway patency. Does the patient have a patent airway? Now, if the patient has a low level of consciousness and we're fairly satisfied that there is no C-spine involvement, then we'll do the normal head tilt first aid procedures. If the patient's got a low level of consciousness, we might think about adjunct airways, such as a Gadel airway, or possibly even endotracheal intubation, if the patient had a very low Glasgow coma scale. Or if we did suspect C-spine control, we would probably think about doing the jaw thrust maneuver, as we do in any sort of first aid immediate situation where we want airway patency. But apart from that, there's particular problems in burns with airway patency because the patient's been inhaling hot gases. There can often be inhalation injury. So the patient's been breathing in the hot gases from the fire. They've been breathing in the smoke that's generated by the fire. And heat, of course, can cause inflammation. And the inflammation can lead to potentially significant airway edema. So the hot gases insult the lining of the respiratory passages inside the nasal, inside the nasal passages, inside the oral cavity, in the pharynx, in the trachea, in the bronchioles, all throughout the airway tract. There's the potential for airway edema. And of course this is massively important because if we think about the airways here we have the trachea and the mouth and above this we have the uh, the nasal cavity so we have the nasal cavity there for air to go in and out the oral cavity where air goes in and out branching into the right and left main bronchus branching into the smaller bronchial passages, which do become progressively smaller as we go down into the bronchial tree. And there's the potential for these hot gases to come into contact as they're inhaled with all the linings they come into contact with. So the oral lining can become inflamed. The nasal cavities can become inflamed, the pharynx, there can be inflammation here and inflammation leads to heat, pain, swelling, loss of function and further down in, and with the smaller airways again relatively small amounts of inflammation, if there's inflammation in the walls of the airways that inflammation is taking up space and is going to close down and reduce the lumen of the airways. So this massive uh, airway edema that can develop is particularly important because the edema is going to reduce the lumen of patent airway that is left and can lead to asphyxiation. So we have to be on our lookout for this possible inhalation injury, especially in patients that have been taken out of a burning environment. So we're going to look at the voice if the patient's conscious. Is the voice becoming hoarse? So the hoarse voice would indicate inflammation in or inflammation of and around the vocal cords, which of course are at the, uh, the, top, of the um, top of the trachea. Or is the patient spitting out carbonaceous sputum? Is there carbon in the sputum. 
which again would indicate inhalation of smoke and smoke can often be superheated meaning that there's a likelihood of inhalation thermal injury or what about burns around the mouth or burns around the nose again these could be caused by hot gases and if the hot gases are burning the mouth and the nose then it's reasonable to assume that they're also burning the lower parts of the airway and look at around look around uh, look in the patient's nostrils see if the nasal hair is singed because if it is the patient has been breathing in superheated gases also look out for stridor so stridor relates to upper airway noisy upper airway noise during ventilation no, stridor and this can be evident even if the patient is unconscious we can hear the upper airway the stridor as the air struggles to get past the obstruction in the upper airways we can hear the stridor And all of these things are going to reduce the ability of the air to get in and out of the patient's lungs. So there are an obvious threat to the airway. And as well as the first, first aid uh, airway management, what we tend to do is give intravenous hydrocortisone at an early stage in the hospital situation. Because the hydrocortisone is a corticosteroid type molecule and it's going to massively reduce the inflammation. Because if we've got these things at an early stage, if we've got history of uh, inhalation injury, if we've got hoarseness, carbonaceous sputum, burns around the, uh, the mouth or nostrils or of the stridor, then that means the inflammatory process has begun and the inflammatory process will continue for a period of time. And as the inflammatory process continues, the swelling will become greater and the risk of airway obstruction and uh, death from airway obstruction is there. So very often prophylactically we can give intravenous hydrocortisone to prevent this. So um, thinking about the airway management, massively important. And still thinking about breathing, if there's circumferential burns, these are burns that go all around the body. So if there's burns that go all around the body, particularly around about the thoracic cavity, even the abdominal cavity, it makes expansion for ventilatory effort more difficult. Because of course, we're only going to suck air into the lungs when the diaphragm goes down and the intercostal muscles pull the ribs up and out. We need these mechanical movements. And these can be inhibited in circumferential burns, although this is usually a later complication, but it's something to keep an eye on. Now, thinking about things that are inhaled, fires, of course, produce carbon dioxide, but they also produce CO, carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is just CO, not CO2, as in carbon dioxide. And the thing about the carbon monoxide molecule is it has a very high affinity for the haemoglobin molecule. So it's the haemoglobin, it's the haemoglobin molecule that transports the oxygen around the body, as you probably know. So normally, in the lungs, the oxygen will combine with haemoglobin in the red cells, forming bright red oxyhemoglobin. This will circulate to the tissues, give up a proportion of its oxygen, and return to the lungs in a somewhat deoxygenated form, deoxyhemoglobin. But the carbon monoxide occupies the normal receptors in the haemoglobin molecules that bind the oxygen and it just sits there it's got a high affinity for it so once the carbon monoxide molecule is there it'll just sit there it won't be released so the carbon monoxide will form this compound with haemoglobin called carboxyhemoglobin and that will be formed because the carbon monoxide has gone into the lungs 
gone across the alveolar membranes and formed this carboxyhemoglobin. But when the carboxyhemoglobin goes to the tissues, it won't give up the carbon monoxide to the tissues, as the oxygen would be given up. And when the carboxyhemoglobin returns to the lungs, again, the carbon monoxide is not, does not diffuse from the blood back into the alveoli as the carbon dioxide would, because the carbon monoxide is firmly bonded to the haemoglobin molecule and it's occupying the carrier site. So blood which has carbon monoxide in it, a haemoglobin molecule which has carbon monoxide attached to it, is completely incapable of carrying any oxygen whatsoever, therefore for a period of time becomes essentially useless. So we need to look out for this uh, carboxyhemoglobin. And of course in hospitals all the time we put on our oxygen saturation probes, look at the patient's uh, blood oxygenation levels, and in the case of carbon monoxide poisoning, these are completely useless. They don't work. So if someone has a lot of uh, carboxyhemoglobin, they're unable to transport oxygen to their tissues. It's basically a form of uh, blood, blood caused hypoxia, that the oxygen is not getting to the tissues because the blood is incapable of transporting it. But this will not show on the oxygen saturation probes because oxyhemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin both absorb the laser light of our oxygen saturation probes in the same way. So if someone's blood is highly saturated with carboxyhemoglobin, they will, on the oxygen saturation probes, they'll have an apparent oxygen saturation of maybe 100. And we think, oh, everything's fine. The sats are 100 or 99 or something. But no, no, the oxygen saturation probe is not picking up oxygen in the hemoglobin it's picking up carbon monoxide in the haemoglobin. So the current generation of SATS probes are useless. So we have to use our clinical judgment. Does the patient have headache? Indicating cerebral hypoxia, are they nauseated? Are they confused from cerebral hypoxia? Is there coma? And, uh, and that can lead to death. And there can also be a, a cherry reddish discoloration of the lips and there can also be a pinkening uh, that the skin can look uh, pink. You get a pink discoloration of the skin with uh, very high levels of carbon monoxide. Very dangerous gas. Doesn't smell colourless. Um, isn't detected by our saturation probes. So we have to recognise it clinically. And what we do is we give these patients very high flow oxygen. Because very high flow oxygen, will the oxygen will knock off some of the uh, carbon monoxide from the haemoglobin, giving us some of our haemoglobin back. So we put these patients immediately on very high flow oxygen. And in fact, in some specialist centres, they'll even use hyperbaric oxygen. And as well as that, of course, putting the patients on high flow oxygen means that any haemoglobin that is left will also be uh, fully saturated. Any haemoglobin that's left that is not occupied by carbon monoxide. But the high flow oxygen will knock off some of the carbon monoxide molecules, um, restoring the ability of the patient's blood to transport oxygen. Very important consideration. And, and, uh, and other thing just to mention, other noxic fumes, I mean, you know, depends what's burning, but anything can be given off. Um, particularly toxic fumes such as cyanide can be immediately life-threatening and there's longer term effects from other nasty things in burning plastics for example such as dioxins. So starting to think about the systemic considerations in burns, remembering that burns are a trauma and are essentially treated as any other trauma but with these particular considerations with regards to airway management and breathing.